Well, good morning, church. Oh, it is good to see everyone this morning. Um, today, we're, we're going to be continuing in our series. Oh, well, first, I have to dismiss Sunshine Club. If you have kids in Sunshine Club, uh, now is the time for them to go ahead, go back through the doors and to the left. Uh, we're very thankful for all of our children's workers and all that they do uh, and teaching our kids more about Jesus. Um, uh-oh. There we go. We're working. All right, good morning. <laughs> We're going to be continuing in our uh, mini-series in John um, 15 through 17 this morning. And we're getting close to the end of the series. Uh, this series has focused on the short time frame in which Jesus is giving his final lessons to the disciples before he's going to be arrested and then crucified. Jesus and the disciples are, are at the Last Supper until Jesus says, rise, let us go from here. And that's where chapter 15 starts. And so this entire time in between chapters 15 through 17, uh, the disciples and Jesus are most likely walking from the upper room to the Garden of Gethsemane. Now these three chapters aren't more important than the rest of Jesus' te teachings, but they do allow us to see what Jesus wanted to communicate with his disciples before he was going to leave them. So the past two chapters, Jesus has been talking directly to the disciples and, and telling him some of these last lessons. But here in chapter 17, we're going to see Jesus switch from talking directly to the disciples to Jesus praying to the Father. This prayer is often referred to as the high priestly prayer. And today in verses 6 through 19, we're going to hear Jesus' prayer on behalf of his disciples. So before we get started, let's pray. Dear God, we, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you have made your word manifest to us. Lord, I pray that as we go through um, the words, Lord, that, that, that you have given us, I pray that you would work on our hearts, Lord. Uh, Lord, that we would desire to be more like you, Lord, that we would desire to be changed by your word. Uh, we just thank you for, for your son, Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. amen. So our desire for this series is that our hearts would align with Jesus' hearts for us. That, that ultimately, that, that we would want to want what Jesus wants. And we're going to see in this passage Jesus' prayer and what he wants for his disciples. And so as we go through this passage, my, my prayer for us is that we would look at Jesus' heart for his disciples and that we would be moved and led to surrender our desires and our hearts to be more like Jesus. So if you have a Bible, please go ahead and turn to John 17, 6 through 19. If you don't have a Bible, that's okay. You can grab one from the pew in front of you and turn to page 903, page 903. And we're going to continue going through Jesus' high priestly prayer. So we'll start in the first four verses, 6 through 10. He says, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that, is, that everything that you have given me is from you, for I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. In this first section, we are going to see the manifested word. So if we look at the beginning of verse 6, it says, I have manifested your name. Jesus right here, he is saying that he has manifested the Father's name. And this is Jesus saying that he has shown the attributes, the qualities, that, that he has displayed and demonstrated the character of the Father. And right off the bat here, Jesus is claiming equality with God. None of us can do this <laughs> because if, if any of us claim to, to, be the, to be the manifestation of, of the Father's name, this would be an insult to God because none of us can come anywhere close to being anything like God. That, that, that is why we call him holy because holy means to be set apart, to be separate. He, he is so set apart and separate from us. He's perfect and we come nowhere close. And so it's amazing and it's humbling that in the reality of our sin and separation from God, God's response is his gracious self-disclosure in Jesus Christ. 
the name of Jesus and the name of the Father are both unique in that they are their own persons, but they are the same God. D.A. Uh, DA Carson's commentary on John related this manifestation of God's name to Exodus 3, 13 through 14, and where it says this. Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what, what is his name? What, what shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And this is really cool because then in John 8, 58, Jesus says this, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So both Jesus and the Father, when asked about their identity, they say, I am. And this is an amazing truth that, that God, the Father, and God, the Son, are both God. They, they're not two separate persons. And so it only makes sense that as we continue through this passage, we're going to continue seeing Jesus being the manifestation of the Father's name. So let's keep reading uh, the, the second part of verse 6. It says, I have manifested your name to the people who you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me. The people Jesus is talking about here is the disciples. And I think it's interesting that Jesus says the Father gave them to Jesus out of the world. They were the fathers, and he gave them to Jesus. So but before the disciples were the disciples, before they even heard of Jesus, they were the fathers. And so what that means is that the Father had a plan for all of eternity to give the disciples to the Son, Jesus, in whom he would make manifest himself. And, and when I read this, this just makes me pause. The God of creation had this redemptive plan since the beginning of time. Before we were conceived, before the disciples were conceived, God planned to manifest himself to us. It wasn't the last resort. It wasn't plan B. It was God's plan A, to make himself known to us by becoming like us. And that's who Jesus is. And, and this, this is so good, and we are only in the first verse. So, so let's keep going. End of verse 6. Jesus continues saying, we're going to go to verse 8. Jesus says, And they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. So the disciples have come to know Jesus, and it says that they have kept the Father's words. So, so what does this mean? Well, they know that all that Jesus has been given is from the Father, and they believe that Jesus himself was sent by the Father. This isn't to say that the disciples knew everything or that they were perfect, let alone everything that was about to take place on the cross. They simply believed who Jesus claimed to be. All, all throughout Jesus' ministry with the disciples, he, he made seven I am statements. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He said, I am the light of the world. He said, I am the door. No one comes to the Father except through me. He said, I am the good shepherd. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then finally, just at the beginning of this miniseries, in John 15, he said, I am the true vine. The disciples believed all these things that Jesus said. That they may not have fully understood all the implications of this, but they understood enough to know that he was sent by the Father and that he was worth them dropping everything that they had and devoting their lives to his teachings and to following him. And again, that, that doesn't mean that they did everything perfect because we watch them continue to mess up. Right after we, we get to the Garden of Gethsemane that, that Jesus is walking with the disciples right now, Peter's going to cut off a soldier's ear. And then just a few hours after that, after Jesus is arrested, Jesus is going to deny even knowing Jesus three times. And if that wasn't enough, Thomas, as, as we know, as doubting Thomas, even after Jesus is risen from the dead and, and other disciples tell him this, he, he refuses to believe until he sees Jesus face to face, until he can put his hands in his side and in the wounds in his hands. That they, they aren't perfect by any means. 
but they believe that Jesus is who he is. They believe that Jesus is the manifested word of God, the Messiah. And, and, and that's, that's what it says in verse 8. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. Simply said, the disciples are in the know. that They know who Jesus is. And, and so, Knowing who Jesus is, I'm sure hearing Jesus pray to the Father would catch their attention because they know the relationship that Jesus has with the Father, especially when he says this in verse 9. Verse 9, he says, I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me. I'm sure all the disciples were were already listening, but but when he prays verse 9, I'm sure he got some head turns. Because his prayer singles them out and sets them apart from the rest of the entire world. He says, I'm praying for them, not for the whole world. Why why not for the whole world? Is there something wrong with praying for the whole world? Should should we not pray for the whole world? No, no, there's nothing wrong with praying for the world. I believe the reason Jesus is singling out the disciples here in his prayer is because he is focusing on the will of the Father that he has planned for them. The Father has given Jesus the disciples, and Jesus and the Father have a plan for them, a plan that that we see unfold all throughout the New Testament as Jesus establishes his church. And this is why I believe that Jesus is specifically praying for them. And that's why Jesus then again repeats how the Father has given given him to the disciples. Then he expounds a little bit further. In verse 10, he goes on to say this. He says, all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. So not only are the disciples the fathers, but they are also Jesus, because the Father has given them to the Son, Jesus. In this way, the plan that the Father has had for the disciples is the same plan that Jesus has for them, because all the Father has is given to Jesus. Jesus is also glorified in his disciples, He is glorified in them because they are following him and not following the world. They are keeping in the Father's name, which glorifies the Father, and that glory is then given to the Son, Jesus. And this is the manifested word. So in this first section, we've seen this manifested word and how Jesus is the manifestation of the Father's name and how the disciples believed this. They know who Jesus is and they believe that he is from the Father and sent by the Father. And then Jesus specifies who he's praying for and that this is specifically for the disciples, not for the world. And then now we get to see what his prayer for the disciples is. And that's our second section that we're going to see. We're going to see the sustaining word. So let's go ahead and read verses 11 through 16. And I am no longer in the world but they are in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name which you have given me. I have guarded them and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak into the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. So in this section, Jesus prays, that the, prays to the, and asks the Father to keep them in your name because Jesus' desire for the disciples is that they would not stray from their path of following him and following the Father. Jesus prays this because he reiterates the beginning, uh, at the beginning of verse 11 that he is leaving. Jesus is going back to the Father. But the disciples are staying in the world. And this is where I believe the disciples get confused. Tim, Tim mentioned this last week in saying that the disciples struggled with, with understanding that Jesus was going to die. They saw Jesus as the manifested word, as, as having all authority and having all power. And so they never expected Jesus to die. 
That no, no one can kill God. Jesus was sent from God by God. He, he can't be killed. And that's because they never would have guessed that Jesus would willingly give himself over to die. Literally, while, while they're walking from the upper room to the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is taking the next steps in God's redemptive plan. And although it's for our good and for the disciples' good as well that Jesus took on the cross, Jesus understands that this is going to be hard for his disciples. And so he takes the time to pray this for his disciples, not just because he cares for them, but because there are benefits to being kept in the Father's name. Do we believe this? Do do we believe that there are benefits to being in the Father's name? I I know that I'm young and that I don't have a a huge amount of life experience to pull from, but but I do remember a time in my life when, when I struggled to believe this. I was blessed to grow up with a wonderful family and with a wonderful church, and I was taught about Jesus for as long as I can remember. But when I was younger, I I struggled to believe that a life lived for God would would be better than a life lived for the world. I I didn't see or really believe that there were benefits to being close to God. The the world just seemed so inviting. It seemed so, so close, so immediately satisfying. And so I chose to believe that that the world had better better benefits and better blessings than God did. Thankfully, though, I, I had people godly people in my life who continued to point me to Christ time and time again. And I was hard-headed, and so it took me a while. But after, after that time of learning more about Jesus and also being let down by the world time and time again, realizing that the world is not going to satisfy, I realized that the blessings and the benefits that awaited me in a life dedicated to Jesus were so much better. It, it's, it's easy it's so easy to not believe that there are benefits in the Father's name. But, but this is usually because we are so preoccupied with, with what we think we are getting or going to get from the world. And so in this, in this time, let, let's try to cast those thoughts aside of what the world's going to offer, and instead let's take a look at what Jesus offers us and what our first blessing is that Jesus says here in verse 11. He says, Keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. Jesus is saying that the disciples, by the disciples continuing to follow Jesus and remain in his name, that they get to experience a unity that is like the unity that God has in the Trinity. And that's crazy. If that doesn't blow your mind, I don't know what will. The disciples can be so united that their their, their unity is comparable to the Trinity. I could go on a whole tangent of trying to to talk about and even putting up diagrams of how complex and how amazing the truth of the Trinity is. But, But I'll simply say this. You can't get more united than the Trinity. The Trinity is unity. It is unity. And this is what the disciples can have in the Father's name. Jesus' desire for the disciples is to experience God in such a way that they would be sustained. That even though Jesus is leaving the world, that they can be united with each other because they are united in God. This is the sustaining word, that in God, through Jesus, we are giving blessings that give us life and life abundantly, not life alone. The disciples are gonna go through some really hard times but they don't have to do it alone because they, of their unity with the Father, they have unity with each other. And I think we can all agree that that life is easier when you're not alone. It's so much easier when you're not alone. We can think of all the hardships that we're gonna go through. It's not fun to go through hardships, period. But if you have to go through them, you want someone by your side that you care about, that you're united with. And this is why I believe Jesus prays for their unity so that they would be sustained even though he's leaving. And Jesus isn't done telling us what blessings can be had in the Father's name. This is just the first one. Jesus mentions another blessing. So let's go ahead, uh, verses 12 and 13. Verse 12 and 13 say, while I was with them, I kept them in your name which you have given me. I have guarded them and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction that the scripture might be fulfilled. 
But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. We see the second blessing in verse 13 when he says this. These things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. The wording here is intentional. And again, I love how D.A. Carson puts it. He says, what is now made clear is that Jesus is concerned with with such a prayer is not the uh, statistics on faithfulness be preserved, but that the disciples might share his joy. Jesus wants his disciples to get to experience the same joy that he himself experiences in the relationship with the Father. That's the level of joy that he desires for them, a joy that is not founded in where we are, but in who we are in. If the disciples remain in God, it doesn't matter if they're in Jerusalem or if they're on the other end of the world because Jesus is praying that the disciples would be sustained in such a way that even though he's leaving, their joy would be the same joy that Jesus presently and forever experiences with the Father in the Father. Jesus was going to the cross in order that we might have unity with the Father and in this unity have joy. And, and all of this, it's, it's all connected Being in the Father's name is what enables us both to have this unity and this joy. And I believe that that, that when we experience this joy and this unity, that it draws us closer to the Father. And in so doing, it brings us more joy and more unity. And this process continues and continues. This sustainment isn't a one-time gift. It's a reproducing blessing that, that brings us closer and closer to the Father. And that is such an amazing blessing that we are given. And and while this sustainment is fantastic, this sustainment is what sets us and the disciples apart from the world. Look at verses 14 and 15. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. I think this is why Jesus is praying for the disciples to be kept in the Father's name. Because he knows the real threat that the world possesses. So because the disciples now know who Jesus is, they know that Jesus was sent from God, the truth has changed them in such a way that they are no longer part of the world. So much so that in verse 14 it tells us the world now hates them. Not just indifferent, not just they're in a different group, hates them. It hates them because they aren't a part of the same team. Tim mentions this, has mentioned this in in multiple Sundays in saying that we are not a part of the home team while we're in the world. We don't have the home team advantage. We are the away team. The disciples are the away team. They are surrounded by a world who is cheering for their downfall. And that's why Jesus is going to be arrested and then falsely accused and crucified on the cross because the world hated him. And so knowing this, Jesus prays not that the Father would take them out of the world or remove all these hardships, but that he would keep them from the evil one, the devil. And what's made clear here is that that the world and the devil are on the same team. So what this means is that the disciples and us, we are in the devil's home field. He has the home field advantage. And so if he sought to tempt, to undermine, to kill Jesus, why wouldn't he try to do the same thing to the disciples? Verse 16 says this then, they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. The world sees the disciples just as they see Jesus the away team, the enemy, same way that they see us. So so Jesus prays that the Father would protect them because their life in the world will be filled with cheers for their downfall because they did it to Jesus. They did it to Jesus in the first place. And the whole reason that the disciples are set apart from the world is because they follow Jesus and because they're in the Father's name. In all these ways, in this unity, in this joy, in this protection, we, we see Uh, Jesus prays for the sustainment of the disciples. Sustainment that's sourced in the name of the Father through Jesus who made it manifest to them. And it brings us the unity, joy, and protection. And from here, Jesus shifts directions in his prayer. 
Which brings us to our third section, which is the sanctifying word. Jesus moves from prayers for sustainment to prayers for sanctification. Look at verses 17 through 19. He says this, sanctify them in your truth, or sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. Most of us know what sanctification means, but but I think it's helpful to remind ourselves sometimes because I I feel like we can can forget the nuances. Sanctification, or or to be sanctified, means to become more holy. Or or in another words that we commonly say, it to become more like Jesus. The, The idea is that we are moving forward and growing in our faith. And so Jesus prays for this growth for his disciples to be in truth. And if we just keep reading, Jesus quickly explains what this truth is. He says, your word is truth. Now again, the wording here is intentional because it's not just saying that the word is true. It's not just saying that the word contains truth, but that the word itself is the standard for truth. The word is is the embodiment of truth. If something doesn't align with the word, then it's not truth, period. And this is where we really get to start to see some amazing crossovers. So, So get ready. First, we need to ask ourselves, what is the word? And I believe what Jesus is talking about here, about what the word is, is the Father's manifested word to the disciples, both the written word and the incarnate word, Jesus. We see this in John 1, 1 and in John 1, 14. In John 1, 1, he says, oh, uh-oh. Oh, there we go. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then John 1, 14, it says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. God has given us his written word in which God has revealed himself to mankind. And then he set the incarnate word, Jesus, in which God reveals himself to, to all of mankind. So, so when Jesus is praying for the Father to sanctify them in truth, this prayer is ultimately for the Father to sanctify them both in his written word and his revealed word through Jesus himself. The incarnate word. If we reread verse 17 with this, it would say something like this. Set them apart or make them holy in the truth of Jesus, both written and incarnate. Jesus' desire for the disciples to grow in their faith by holding close, cl- close to the truth of who he is and in so doing, setting themselves apart from the sinful world. And Jesus desires the same for us today. We should be set apart by the truth of Jesus. We should be growing closer to Jesus and further from the world, and the world should see this. It's it's all too easy for us to be Christians on Sundays, but be like everyone else on every other day of the week. It shouldn't just be other Christians who know that we believe in Jesus and know that we want to live for Jesus. The world around us should know our coworkers, our neighbors, our friends, our family, everyone that we know should know that we want to live a life and that we are living a life for Christ. Because the way we live should set us apart from the world. And that truth of Jesus sets us apart from the world. Do, do we just blend in? Do, do we want to just blend in? Because the truth is, God doesn't want us to just blend in. Just like the disciples, Jesus is sending us into the world to make known the truth of who he is and what he has done. Jesus was sent into the world because he was on a redemptive plan to take on our sins upon himself at the cross. Jesus was sent with a purpose. And then we see here in verse 18 how he's now sending his disciples with a purpose. Verse 18 says, As you sent me into the world, so I sent them into the world. Jesus doesn't pray that the disciples would be sanctified so that they would sit around and do nothing. 
He prays for them to be sanctified because he has a plan to send them into the world the same way that Jesus was sent into the world. Now, this doesn't mean that the disciples are going out to die for people's sins. That, that's, that's not what this is saying here. What this is saying is that they're going out to tell people who has died for their sins. Jesus. Jesus wants the disciples to be set apart in the Father's name and then to set their own lives apart for the good news of the gospel. And in the same way, in, it, this is in the same way that Jesus set his own life apart. And we, we see this in verse 19. Verse 19 says, and for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. The word that we read here in our ESV, consecrate, is the same word that's actually used up in verse 17 that translates sanctify. If you're reading an NIV or a different translation, it may just say sanctify. Now, this isn't to say that, that Jesus needs to work on himself that, that he actually needs to grow in his faith because he isn't perfect. That's, that's not what this is saying. That's, that's heretical. What Jesus is saying here, though, is that he set himself apart for the work that the Father had given him. Jesus did this. He set himself apart. He took on the cross so that we could be sanctified in the truth of his death, burial, and resurrection. This is the good news that Jesus is sending his disciples into the world to share. The good news that the truth of Jesus saves, sustains, and sanctifies us. And that's the good news of the gospel. That if you put your faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and make him the king of your life, realizing that you need a savior because you can't do it on your own. Your sins are forgiven. You no longer belong to the world, but you become adopted and become a child of God where you can experience the blessings and the joys of being a part of his family. And so if you're here this morning and you haven't made a decision to follow Jesus, I pray that you would. We, we see in today's passage Jesus' heart for those who follow him, what he wants for those who follow him. And so I pray that the truth of who Jesus is would bring you to make him the king of your life. Because the God of the universe set himself apart for our benefit. We are offered to, to experience the unity of God and the joy of God. Unity that will bring us closer than anything the world has to offer. And joy that is greater than all the possessions the world could give. So what are we going to do with the, tru the, the truth of Christ that has been revealed to us? because it wasn't just a one-time offer. Salvation and these blessings are offered to us right now. So will we choose to accept and choose to remain in the Father's name, or will we choose to remain in the world? I pray that we would choose Jesus, because he is waiting with open arms for all those who seek him. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you that you pursue us. Lord, that you don't just leave us to our own vices. Lord, that you actively sought to come down to the world, Lord. It wasn't your plan B or C, Lord. It was your plan since the beginning of time, Lord, that you were going to come to earth as one of us and save us. We thank you for that truth, Lord. I pray that that would change our lives, Lord, that our hearts would be changed by that truth, Lord, and we would want to, to be like Christ, that we would want to love like Christ loves us. Lord, that it wouldn't just be a decision, Lord, that, that we think is great and that we, that we make on a Sunday, Lord, but that it would influence every single part of our lives, that as we walk through our, our daily routines, Lord, that, that it would be changed by the truth of your word. Lord, that everyone around us, that the world would see, Lord, that we are yours that we choose to follow Jesus, not them. Lord, I pray that this would renew us, that we would find this unity and that we would find this joy, Lord, and that we would seek to be in your name. I pray this all in your son's name, Jesus. Amen.